Welcome to today's AIA Housing Knowledge Community presentation, Form Follows Energy, Achieving the Passive House Standard for Habitat for Humanity. This is the fourth in a 2012 series of webinars on research in the residential sector. My name is Steve Schreiber, and I'm your moderator. We'd like to thank the following organizations for spreading the word about today's event. The AIA knowledge communities have several free webinars. You can learn more and register by visiting the AIA Knowledge Net's event calendar at network.aia.org. If you missed the research series, please visit the Housing Knowledge Community Library on AIA Knowledge Net to view the recordings, download the handouts, and questions and answers. Today's presentation is copyright 2012, the American Institute of Architects. You should have received a link to a PDF copy of the presentation in the reminder email. The link can be found now in the chat box at the right-hand portion of your screen. Today's presentation will be available online after this live event. AIA Knowledge is a registered provider with the American Institute of Architects Continuing Education Systems. Today's presentation is worth one Health, Safety, and Welfare Sustainable Design Continuing Education Hour for Licensed Architects and one elective Supplemental Experience Hour for interns enrolled in the Intern Development Program. In order to receive credit, you will need to follow the link provided in the chat box at the conclusion of the live presentation. This link will also be provided in the follow-up email you will receive one hour after the conclusion of the webinar. Attendees must complete the form within 24 hours of the webinar. Today we will learn the principles of passive house design, envelope specifications, insulation, air sealing, and thermal bridge-free details, mechanical systems, and modeling in the PHPP, followed by a walkthrough of the construction of a passive house in northern Vermont. We will close with a review lessons learned and think about what is to come. Among other outcomes, attendees evaluate the benefits of low-load homes, including reduced operating costs, increased comfort, durability, and health, and as the best path to net zero. Joining me today is the presenter, J.B. Clancy, AIA. J.B. is an architect and partner at Albert Ryder and Tippmann Architects in Boston. JB's main focus is residential architecture and sustainable design. JB is a certified passive house consultant and has designed a certified passive house for Habitat for Humanity in Vermont. If you have a question at any point during the webinar, please enter it in the chat box and it will be sent to me, your moderator. All content related questions will be answered at the end of the webinar as time permits. All technical questions will be answered as soon as possible. Welcome, JB. Thank you, Stephen, and welcome, everyone. Um, looking forward to sharing our experience with this project with all of you. This talk is titled Form Follows Energy because I believe the built environment is a direct reflection of the energy context we all live in. I'm defining our energy context as the amount of energy we have available to us as a society, which includes the energy to run and construct our buildings. Our context is represented here in this graph from the U.S. Energy Information Agency. It shows energy consumption by source in the U.S. from 1630 to the present. The vertical lines mark the century marks, and you can see how dramatically this context has changed over the, next, over the, over the years. 
In the next seven slides, I hope to illustrate how this context is influences the choices we make as architects. That as much as form follows function, form does and will continue to follow energy. House 1630. The first houses in colonial America looked very much like this. This is a reconstruction of a house at the Plymouth Plantation here in Plymouth, Massachusetts. What is the energy context? Essentially, a bio-based fuel source like wood. No fossil fuels. And think if you, as a builder, only had some simple tools at your disposal, or the, the energy from your own body, what kind of house would you construct? It would likely be very simple and small, oriented around a fireplace. Um, there would be very few manufactured materials, such as glass. If you did have access to them, you would use them very selectively. Think of how carefully you might place that window if you only had that amount of glass to use. A hundred years later, in 1732, the context is very much the same. The building looks similar, too. It's a simple form oriented around a large fireplace. The building is made of wood and heated with wood. The one obvious difference here is there's a lot more glass, and it's primarily on the south side of the building. This may be one of America's first passive solar buildings. I visited this house recently and was delighted to learn that the large facade faced south and the roofs faced north. In fact, all the houses along this road, which were built at a similar time, had the exact same geometry and the same orientation. Also interesting is where the ornament is on the building, how selectively it's used only around the main entryway. Now 150 years later, the context is completely different. We're now in the fossil fuel area, and the building looks completely different. The plan has literally exploded. Gone is the simple form oriented around a central fireplace. There's no prime orientation, no simple shape. The burning of coal can be used to heat hot water, which can be distributed around the house to heat the building. Most of the materials used to build the house are manufactured in factories, including the ornament. The salt box shape of the Hartwell Tavern is a form primarily found in New England, whereas a Victorian structure like this could easily be found in Boston or San Francisco. Fossil fuels determine the new context, not the local climate. In the middle of the 20th century, have mastered the ability to harness energy from fossil fuels. This is the context in which the famous Farnsworth House, designed by Mies van der Rohe in 19, was built in Plano, Illinois in 1951. This building has no regard for climate because it doesn't have to. Cheap energy and mechanical systems can overcome the demands of climate. Through large amounts of fossil fuel, the idea of an international style is actually possible. The house is made with highly processed materials like steel and glass, which have a high embodied energy content. Imagine the R value of this facade, probably R1. And the house can literally defy the laws of nature like gravity as expressed in the cantilevers. From the perspective of energy, what I find interesting is actually how, how decadent this building is. And if you care about how much energy buildings consume, um, looking at design through the lens of energy will likely change how you see buildings. In 1973, the notion that energy would be forever cheap and plentiful was called into question with the OPEC oil embargo. After that, the supply of oil was reduced, prices spiked, and buildings changed to reflect that new context. The passive solar and super insulation movements began to take off, and architects began to look for ways to design buildings to consume less energy. A weatherization program was set up by the federal government to retrofit old houses. And look at the graph, the amount of energy we consumed after that period actually dropped. This is the so-called low-cal house for low calorie, built by Wayne Schick at, at the University of Illinois. It was one of the first super-insulated houses built in the United States. It had double stud walls with an R value of R30, an R33 ceiling, triple pane windows, and an air-to-air -air heat exchanger. And believe it or not, this building was built 35 years ago. For an incredible presentation on the history of super-insulated houses, I suggest you look up Martin Holliday's presentation on Green Building Advisor. A decade later, the price of oil dropped, and we forgot all about the lessons learned from the 1970s. There was no need. Energy was once again cheap and plentiful, and our houses reflected that. We made them bigger than ever before. 
the size of the average house actually grew from around 1,000 square feet in 1950 to almost 2,400 square feet by 2004, even when our family sizes were decreasing. These houses are all made of highly processed materials, many of them with a high petroleum content, like the carpet, the vinyl siding, the vinyl floors. They're oversized, and they rely entirely on the car. And they use a large amount of energy to keep them warm and cool in the summer. So here we are in the 21st century, and we're presented with a new context, one that is more about limited rather than unlimited resources. Why? Well, because the burning of fossil fuels, as we know, is changing our climate. If the Architecture 2030 challenges our new context, how will this shape our future built environment? How will this influence the choices we make? And how do we do this? Well, one way is through the Passive House Energy Standard. This is a green building standard literally built on an energy budget for the 21st century energy context. And here is the standard itself. We have a heat demand of 4.75 kilobtus per square foot per year, a cooling demand of 4.75 kilobtus per square foot per year, a total energy demand of 38 kilobtus per square foot per year, which is measured as source energy, which means that it's not the energy just coming out of the plug but is taken all the way back to the point at which the energy was generated, and an air tightness performance test, which has to achieve 0.6 air changes per hour at 50 pascals. And the three earlier um, values are as modeled in the PHPP, which is known as the Passive House Planning Package. And here is that standard in comparison to some other standards that you might be familiar with. The Energy Star standard is in the middle passive houses on the far left. As you can see, this is a dramatic reduction in energy consumption over current codes and standards. Again, why an energy budget? Well, um, Architecture 2030 has done some amazing work on this in calculating how much energy our buildings actually consume. And the running of buildings is actually one of the largest energy consumers in our society. And most of that energy comes from fossil fuels, as we just reviewed. So let me now take you through the passive house concept. Not many people are aware of or know that passive house really has its roots in North America. Um, in the projects that I described earlier, in projects here and around Boston, out in Colorado. Um, during the 70s, an incredible amount of work was done in this country on super insulated passive solar buildings. Um, in fact, according to the Passive House Institute, um, they actually credit with Amory Levins um, for suggesting that Passive House should be more than just a research project, but an actual energy standard. The original concept of Passive House was to create a building that, through extreme energy efficiency measures, could be heated entirely with passive means, um, that being uh, energy from the sun, waste heat internally um, that was captured and kept within the envelope. To achieve this, the maximum heat load value was established at 10 watts per meter squared, or 1 watt per square foot. And these pictures here show the first passive house built in Darmstadt, Germany, by Dr. Wolfgang Feist. As I said before, um, passive house really is relying on uh, a reduction of loads within the building um, to then be uh, met through passive means. This chart here shows a conventional building versus a passive house building. And it shows how through the dramatic reduction of losses, one then only has to supply a limited amount of gains to meet the need of the building. And the idea that this then represents a balanced energy load through minimizing losses and maximizing gains is really central to the passive house idea. Another way to kind of think about passive house is you have a problem of how to keep coffee warm. The old way was to let the craft sit on a hot plate and be heated through the injection of energy into, um, into the coffee. Now, coffee, after it is heated, 
goes into a thermos. And it's the envelope of the thermos that retains the heat um, from the coffee. Therefore, only having to supply the initial energy to keep to heat the coffee. Passive house, as I said, as we know it today with a capital P and a capital H, was started in, um, in Germany at the Passive House Institute in Darmstadt by Dr. Wolfgang Feist. That organization is still there and strong. Over 20,000 passive houses have been built in Europe. Um, there is an organization uh, called the International Passive House Alliance, which is a larger trade organization, and they administer a wonderful website called Passivepedia, which I'll have in resources at the end um, that can be used to get information about Passive House. In addition, there's a group in the United States, the Passive House Institute US, um, which is also um, uh, an organization promoting Passive House and the ideas of Passive House in the United States. So key to the Passive House concept is that it's a completely integrated system um, that uh, you kind of let the architecture do the work. And now we're going to kind of walk through all the individual components that um, create that, that system. So the first is, as we said before, minimizing losses. And you do that through insulation, and a lot of it. Um, these are some R values at the bottom that we used in the Habitat for Humanity Passive House. Um, they're essentially probably triple what you would normally expect in most buildings. Um, R60 walls, R90 ceiling, R60 slab with high performance triple pane windows. Another critical component to passive house design is to eliminate thermal bridges. Um, this is probably some of the low-hanging fruit and even in most conventional wall systems. Um, but when you get down to a low-load home, like a passive house, thermal bridges can become even more significant. The passive house planning package requires that any, any thermal bridge above a value of 0.01 watts per meters Kelvin be documented and calculated. Therefore, all buildings must both model and account for the thermal bridging within their envelopes. Air infiltration, I mentioned in the, um, in the, the standard early on, the 0.6 air changes at 50 pascals. Um, this is uh, achieved through an integrated air barrier surrounding the entire envelope and is critical to not only the energy performance of a passive house, but also toward other elements like um, uh, you know keeping unwanted leaks in buildings creating potential moisture problems at that those leaky spots so this is done through a blower door test depressurizing the building and and measuring the air changes per hour with that device and for a building to become a certified passive house this is one of the requirements that it must meet so once you do that once you minimize your losses, then you can start to look toward things like you know, the heat load, heat loss from a person as being a potential gain, equipment, and of course the sun. For the Habitat for Humanity house, two-thirds of the energy needed to heat the building are actually going to come through the windows, and the other comes from equipment losses and people. So three-quarters of the energy is being met through these passive gains. The nice thing about the sun is that we can predict exactly where it is at any time or day during the year. So we can use the architecture um, to control the amount of sun that we want to come in the building and when we want to, it to come in. And that's a critical point because another component of passive house is that the windows themselves, which I'll talk about a little more specifically, allow more energy in than they reflect energy. Most conventional windows are built to reflect energy, whereas a passive house window is meant to actually allow that energy in through the envelope. So one has to be mindful of in the times of year when you don't want that energy to come in to keep it off the facade or the windows. Solar thermal and other passive means to meet the total energy demand of the building. If you remember earlier, there were two values. One was specifically talking about the heat demand for the building, and the other was looking at the total energy demand for the building. So a passive solar th thermal system, which allows for the 
passive heating of hot water um, is a critical component to achieving this standard. Now when you build such a tight envelope, you obviously need to bring fresh air into the building. This is done through a heat recovery ventilator um, set at a minimum 0.3 air changes per hour. Um, the device itself uh, allows you to recapture the heat in the exhaust air in the incoming fresh air. Um, critical to this device is the efficiency of that heat recovery and also making sure that the unit itself that you've selected doesn't take a lot of energy to run. Um, and there are several manufacturers out there who make units that achieve exactly that. Um, incredible heat recovery with very uh, low wattage motors. The interesting thing about ventilation is we're finding in all the buildings we build when we test them, even when the contractor is not trying, we're showing that the blower door is saying that the building needs mechanical ventilation. So, and this was kind of built around the passive house idea was that they realized ventilation wasn't optional, it was necessary. So once you do that, once you paid for that equipment, then you might as well go and optimize everything else to dramatically reduce your loads. And then you can really look to this as being the central piece of equipment in the mechanical system. And as I said before, um, it's an integrated system. And the integration of all these components is what's critical to the success of that. And this just shows you using the Passive House planning package and the various measures to get down to Passive House, how each strategy contributes to the reduction. And you can see not one will get you all the way there. It's only a combination of all of them which allows you to get down to the dramatic reductions that are required to achieve a Passive House building. As I said before, the Passive House planning package is a software um, that is used to design a Passive House. It's essentially a very elaborate Excel spreadsheet, um, but this will allow you to plan the energy balance of the building, to analyze the ventilation system, to analyze where your windows go, the specification of your windows, um, the R values, et cetera. Because it is a performance standard, not a prescriptive standard, um, you as the architect and the designer are really you know, at the, the controls for how you achieve that. So if you choose to have a lot of north-facing glass because of some other design consideration, you'll balance that with some other measure in terms of maybe equipment efficiency or uh, glazing on the southern side, et cetera, et cetera. And that piece of software has actually been tested against measured buildings in Europe and it's proven to be an incredibly accurate piece of, of software, mainly because it goes into such an incredible level of detail in terms of building envelope and these specifications. So what does this result in? Well, it results in a building, as we've said before, uh, that has a dramatic reduction in energy consumption. But along with that, it also brings in a whole host of other qualities that I think any building would like to have amazing indoor air quality, incredible occupant comfort, no thermal bridging anywhere, um, there are no drafts um, coming off the glass of the windows due to the interior surface temperature of the glass itself with the triple pane windows, obviously lower annual energy costs and a smaller carbon footprint. And because of the building science focused attention to the building envelope, more durable construction details. So just a quick summary, um, Passive House, the concept is really envelope focused. Um, ventilation with heat recovery is critical and it's optimized through integrated design using energy modeling. And these are just some little ideas that I like to keep in my head when I think about some of these buildings as one is kind of moving through the design, that the focus is really on energy conservation. So you're trying to do more with less energy and to get to there, to get to this level, simple is usually better than complex, passive better than active. And remember, moving parts fail. That's the nice thing about insulation. So now let me walk you through the passive house we designed and built for Habitat for Humanity in Charlotte, Vermont. 
Um, the project team, the client, was Green Mountain Habitat for Humanity. They're a chapter of Habitat for Humanity in the Burlington, Vermont area. We were the architects. Um, a critical uh, uh, person in this whole project was Peter Schneider from the Vermont Energy Investment Corporation. It was really Peter's idea to marry Passive House and Habitat for Humanity to bring those two organizations together. And Peter has also provided a lot of the technical um, support on the kind of both not only the energy modeling but also um, the post-occupancy um, performance uh, 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 work that's been going on. So here is the plan. It's a very simple building. Um, it's a three bedroom, two bath, 1,350 square foot gross with a full basement. Um, there's an open living kitchen dining on the south side, two bedrooms above also on the south side, and a, and a bedroom off to the back. This program was, was really determined by Habitat for Humanity um, in terms of the first floor bedroom, um, the bathroom mix, um, and uh, one thing about that simple volume is from a kind of air sealing uh, and envelope specification, it made um, those details a lot easier, which we'll kind of review in just a minute. So you can see here the elevations. Um, below is the glazing percentage, is a percentage of TFA. TFA means treated floor area, which is just the area measurement um, for the passive house building. I think what you'll notice is, you know, 8% glazing area. Um, that, you know, is, is clearly adequate for passive house, but we're not talking about a building that has a large, you know, glass wall with, you know, 15 or 20% uh, glazing to floor area uh, ratio. Um, passive houses do not have to be, you know, entirely glazed on the south side to achieve what you're hoping to achieve. And you can also see how on the other orientations, the northeast and west, the glazing percentage is much less. And here you are looking at the north elevation. Very few windows, of course. Um, here is a cross-section through the building. Uh, it gives you kind of a general sense of the insulation wrap. Um, one thing that we tried to do uh, um, is to, um, in the roof design, knowing that we're going to need a very, very high R value um, to simplify that so that there are no sloped assemblies. The insulation just sits kind of flat on the ceiling, and that kind of resulted in the geometry that you see here. Starting at the footing, the building sits on four inches of high-load extruded polystyrene the slab itself sits on 12 inches of extruded polystyrene. There's about uh, 6 inches on the exterior and 4 inches of, of uh, Thermax on the interior. So we have a highly insulated foundation system completely isolating the footing from the ground. And you can see that here modeled in a program called Therm, uh, which again I had mentioned the, the thermal bridging. Um, as being a really critical component to passive house design, thermal bridge free design. Using the therm program, one can analyze whether or not you have a thermal bridge. And you can also see the difference here between a code footing and our passive house footing. Now, that amount of insulation to the slab, especially with extruded polystyrene, um, it is a lot of insulation. And, and after we did this project, there were reports that came out that talked about the global warming potential of that particular insulation material. I think this is one of the things when one is doing a project with large amounts of material like this, that you are aware of the potential global warming impact of the making of the material itself versus the conservation. That said, I know they use this material in Europe, and it does have a much lower global warming potential given the way it's manufactured. So just something to be aware of as one is specifying various materials for these super insulated assemblies. Here we are at the transition between the uh, foundation and the first floor. Um, to be thermal bridge free, we chose to essentially have six inches of Thermax, which is screwed and strapped to the exterior of a two by six frame that's dense packed. Um, uh, uh, with cellulose insulation, and here's a cutaway of that uh, actual wall system. 
So that six inches of insulation wrapping around the entire building gives us a completely thermal bridge-free envelope. Um, the way it was built, we also had an airtight drywall and a zip wall system. So we had a lot of belts and suspenders to get our air barrier. The second floor, that insulation continues up past the, uh, uh, the, the platform of the second floor system itself. You can see we had a 2 by 12 window buck that was set into the 2 by 6 wall, which held the windows out at the plane of the insulation. This is a detail where there are many different ways to do that. Some passive houses will have the windows directly in the middle of the wall, which thermally is probably ideal to align the thermal barrier. Um, in this case, we chose to set them out. It was just a decision that was made um, from a constructability standpoint for the um, for the for Habitat for Humanity and the water details that would have that were being developed um, for the window in this wall system. Here we are at the eave. You can see the two feet of insulation um, loose blown. Uh, the air barrier continues on the drywall ceiling plane of the building. So we really look to keep um, any penetrations through that uh, drywall layer to a minimum. And that allowed us to get a very high R value in a very tight envelope. The windows for the house, I mentioned before, they have a very high solar heat gain coefficient, allowing more energy to come in through them than are reflected. We used a, a window called uh, Thermatech windows, which do offer a very high solar heat gain coefficient and very good U-value performance. They are fiberglass windows um, that are insulated. And I think this kind of is a slide from, from their organization. It kind of shows the idea of Passive House quite well, where the windows are actually you gain more energy through them than losing, and than you lose through them. And that's a critical component to any passive house. Here you are looking at that uh, fiberglass frame insulated in a casement style. There are also other types of windows that are made in Europe mainly. Um, this is showing an extruded vinyl um, tilt turn window, multi-chambered um, kind of vinyl extrusion, which has very good U-value performance and very good air sealing, too. The HVAC system for this house, um, even though most of the energy provided is through passive means, we do, in northern Vermont, need some kind of actual um, uh, heating system for the house. And that system for this building was Mitsubishi Hyperheat um, air source heat pump with a design load of about 12,000 BTUs per hour very, very, very um, uh, low load building, so it required a very small amount of equipment. We also had the heat recovery ventilator I'd mentioned um, and the solar hot water system. The nice thing about these new air source heat pumps is they can operate at very low temperatures. This one can go down to minus 13 degrees Fahrenheit. And it performed very well this past winter, even when the temperatures plummeted below zero. It was more than enough to meet the heat demands for this building. In fact, it's only providing it at one specific point in the building. It's not a ducted system. It's a point source heater in the living room. And that point source, given the, the strength of the envelope, allowed every room to be you know, within a couple degrees of each other, um, even on the coldest days in the winter. Here we are looking inside a heat recovery ventilator. The, um, the transition of the heat energy from the exhaust air to the incoming fresh air that we mentioned. Um, what's really important, as I said before, about these units is not only the efficiency of the heat recovery, but the amount of energy it takes to run this unit. And if you're working in the passive house planning package, you will be asked to input that amount of information into your energy model so you can see um, how that impacts the overall energy performance of the building. Here we are looking at the ventilation system of the building. Um, very simple supply to all the um, living spaces, exhaust at the bathrooms, and exhaust in one place at the kitchen. Also critical to a low energy building are the appliances that one specifies for the building. We chose all ENERGY STAR Tier 3 appliances 
um, which on the Energy Star website you can go and, and look up and analyze the amount of kilowatt hours per year that each of those is going to likely use. Um, that would also be input into the passive house energy model. So here we are looking at the verification page of the PHPP, and you can see you know, we did design a certified passive house, so all the columns on the right say yes. Um, in relation to the um, values that I mentioned earlier, the 4.75, our heat demand was in the 4.22 range, and we're actually you know, quite a bit below the 38 kilobtus per square foot per year total energy requirement. Um, again, there's nothing about passive house that says you can't consume less than the standard. What it's really saying is this is the maximum you can, you can, um, you can, you can use. And this is just another screenshot from the software itself. You can see the many, many tabs um, down below, um, which are detailing all the different components of the facade. This is the window page. What it shows you in the kind of right-hand side is how the windows themselves are gaining more energy than they're losing. Um, you know, again, I conceptually a, a critical idea to the idea of a passive house that the windows actually become net energy gainers rather than losers. As I said before, the building has to achieve 0.6 air changes per hour at 50 pascals. Here we are. This is the actual blower door test for our um, uh, building. We hit 0.41 ACH 50, or about 102 CFM at 50 pascals. A very, very low amount of leakage um, came through this envelope. Um, one of the real benefits um, in this whole project has been the post-construction kind of performance monitoring system that was installed by Peter Schneider of the Vermont Energy Investment Corporation. So ongoing, we uh, and VEIC is monitoring and measuring temperature, indoor air quality, relative humidity, and also the energy consumption of the building itself. And I'm going to share with you some of the data that we've gotten out of one year of, um, of organization, uh, of, of operation of this building. So here we are last, um, I guess last October. Um, you can see the graph at the bottom in red shows the air temperature. So we had a low of maybe 40, a high of 55. And you can see the range of indoor air temperature kind of you know, floating in the 70s. And you can see on the bottom the amount of energy needed to you know, keep the building warm. So when the, the temperature got down to 30s, the heat pump turned on um, for a brief period. But that was the only time the heat came on in October. And when we start to get further into the heating season, here we are in, um, in December. Uh, this shows the entire month. And the total energy usage for that heat pump to keep the building more or less between 68 and 72 degrees uh, was 135 kilowatt hours. Um, if you were to take this and say, you know, what's that the equivalent energy to? Well, that's a couple hundred watt light bulbs, you know, running continuous. So um, that is the, the impact of this high performance envelope on the total heat demand needed to keep the building at a comfortable temperature in, in northern Vermont. And here we are again in January. Uh, it got even colder there, you know, approaching zero. Um, the temperature of all the rooms stayed very consistent. Um, the kilowatt hours increased from December, but this is still a very, very low amount of energy needed to keep that building at temperature in a very cold part of the U.S. Indoor air quality, I think, is uh, is a critical component to any passive house building and one of those nice kind of um, results that you get from focusing on things like uh, um, energy reduction. Here you can see uh, the indoor air quality um, as measured in the building consistently below a thousand parts per million and then the wattage to run this, um, this unit. Uh, you know, really when it's in continuous operation, it's about 18 watts continuous. Uh, which is the equivalent of you know a fairly uh, good sized CFL light bulb. So we're not talking a lot of energy to run this unit. Um, you can also see when that um, 
around the 16th of, of September when that unit was boosted, you can see the corresponding drop in parts per million of CO2 concentrations in the, in the, uh, in the house. So this is just a chart showing you, you know, kind of optimal levels for CO2 in a house. So anything below 1,000 is, is a very good result. And here we are looking at the indoor air quality and the, the efficiency of the unit, which we've also been tracking. And that seems to be kind of matching, you know, the manufacturer's specifications. So we're looking, you know, on average about 95% efficiency, which means that the air coming out of the supply duct is very close to the air that was being exhausted. And, and that is important from a comfort standpoint, so you aren't dumping, you know, 50 degree air into rooms throughout the house. Domestic hot water, I'd mentioned before, this house has a solar thermal system. And this just shows you the total energy consumed um, for that system to heat the hot water. Uh, it's actually, you know, relative to the other loads in the building, hot water, when you reduce the energy to heat the building so much, hot water can actually become quite a significant load. Cooling. Now, this is something that I want to kind of touch on here because I think it's an important part. Um, we definitely saw some warmer temperatures than one may have wanted, and the, um, the heat pump turned on for cooling. And you can see the PHP P more or less predicted that we were going to have a cooling demand in the summer. So shading is critical in a passive house, and we did not have it on the, on the lower southern side windows. And you could really see that in the temperatures inside. So there are plans for a trellis to be built um, before we get into the warmer parts of the summer. And hopefully that will help keep a lot of that unwanted passive solar gain in the summer out of the building. So how much energy did they use in a year? Well, about 5,600 kilowatt hours, which a small kind of 4KW array would probably put this house at about net zero. And you can see here um, where that domestic hot water load is one of the more significant loads um, in the house, um, probably representing about a quarter of the energy. The heat load is at the bottom, and then the plug loads above. So we actually compared this to the annual heating costs from something called the Vermont Baseline Average, which VEIC had kind of uh, studied. And you can see here the passive house in red is a dramatic reduction in total energy consumption to heat this building over the year. So VEIC measured about 300 new houses and estimated their heating costs. Um, the nice thing about matching this with habitat is if energy prices were to double, the family in the habitat house is really going to be isolated from that fuel cost escalation. The other thing to think about when you're thinking about total costs and, and return on um, uh, investment is what's the total cost to operate. And this chart just kind of shows a scenario of you pay more for the passive house, say 10% more or a $15,000 premium. But the energy you save on a monthly basis can more than cover that increased cost on your mortgage. Um, so the total cost to own and operate a passive house is actually less than the conventional building. So let me just take you through the construction. It was also built modular. So this just shows you the modular um, arrangement of the pieces. Here we are in the modular factory. Um, air sealing was critical throughout. Um, blocking within the uh, open web truss and air sealing. EPDM gasket was set on the floor. So when the walls were put on that, we had a perfect air seal there. Um, it was uh, essentially the drywalls attached to the stud frame through, um, through urethane foam, uh, creating a perfect airtight drywall installation. You can see that here. Walls were then tilted up. All headers were sized to the specific load and insulated. Foam sealed around behind tubs. OVE framing, so everything was done on 24 inch on centers with single top and bottom plates. There's a 20 inch raised seal truss that allowed us to get the two feet of insulation up in the ceiling. Dense stack cellulose was then installed. 
all the penetrations were air sealed. Any penetration through the wall was continued to be air sealed. Now you can see the zip wall, which was taped, all the um, window and, and door installations air sealed. Here we have the rigid insulation being screwed and strapped to the exterior of the building. And that was done in 10 working days. So modular, although is not critical for Passive House, um, worked well for this particular project. And here we are kind of assembling that building that morning in September of last year. So what was critical after the building was assembled for the Habitat volunteers would go in, um, seal up all those seams, and, um, and pull the rigid insulation across to complete the thermal bridge-free um, envelope. And then on top of that strapping, you know, hardy plank siding was installed, asphalt shingle roof, the solar thermal system was put in place. And during the month of January, when it was still being finished inside, this was the only heating device in the house. And it really, it kept every room at about 72 degrees and cost about $30 to run. So that was the first sign that, that things were going to be working well for this building. But now, as I mentioned before, we're using a Mitsubishi air source heat pump and that's the head on the wall that provides the heating and cooling for the building. Here's the mechanical system, the ventilation system, the solar thermal system. And there's the exterior unit of the, uh, of the air source heat pump that's tied into that unit that was mounted on the wall. And here's the building completed. You can see the thick walls in this picture, kind of a trademark of any super insulated building. And you can see that we need that trellis on those southern windows. So just to kind of sum up, um, to me, Passive House really shows the true potential of the building envelope um, and the power of integrated design that through um, you know, the, the information that we have available to us and the elements that we control as architects, we can um, truly design buildings to um, meet this new 21st century energy context. And here are just some links to um, uh, other organizations and the Passipedia website where you could go to for more information about passive house design and buildings. Um, thank you. I understand there's probably an interest in some questions, so um, I'm kind of open for that now. Thank you so much, JD. Um, so I'm going to go through some of the questions. A number of questions came in, so I am going to go through these um, selectively because I think some of them were answered along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, one question is, with windows being such a high energy loss during non-sun periods, is there any automatic exterior window insulation available to your knowledge? I say exterior as attempting to utilize interior insulation. I find condensation and ice on the interior of glass is a problem. I live in Michigan with quite cold winters. Yeah, I have not heard of any um, exterior insulation products for windows. Um, I do know with the triple pane uh, glazing technology and very well built um, low U value frames that any risk of condensation on the frame itself will be completely eliminated. And even in very, very cold nights, the interior surface temperature of that glass should be warm enough so as to eliminate, um, to eliminate any kind of convection on that surface. I do know that with European style windows that kind of tilt and turn in, there are several exterior shading devices which have been developed. And I think um, you know, that's something that I think for any solar, high solar gain window 
is a critical component even even in northern New England. Thanks. Um, another question. You mentioned the 8% glazed area for the habitat house. And how one doesn't need a large south-facing glass area. Isn't it important to stress the problems with overglazing, overheating during the day, inhabitant discomfort, fabric and finish, UV damage and discoloration, etc.? Yes, no, I think that is important. Um, my initial concept of passive solar buildings was they had, you know, a, a facade on the south side that was 100% glass. And um, that's really proven not to be necessary to hit the passive house standard. And, um, and usually anything over 8%, you might even find yourself overglazed and possibly even overheating in, in winter days during the middle of winter. So I think the amount of solar gain you bring in through the envelope has to be studied and measured. And the passive house planning package is, is an amazing tool to, to analyze that. And you could see we had some problems with excessive gains in the summer. Um, so those are being addressed now through shading measures. Um, but you know, the passive house planning package also indicated that we were likely going to have a load that we were going to have to deal with. So I think the software itself was accurate. Um, but, uh, but yes, no, a, a passive house is not a building with um, large, large amounts of glass on the south side. In fact, you would likely you would definitely overheat the building in a climate like we have here in, in New England. In your experience, what's the optimal amount of insulation versus reduced energy cost? So it's that is, um, you know, I think one thing that the passive house energy standard has set is is one number that is not necessarily climate specific. So as you were, if you were to take the habitat house and move it down to Boston and then move it down to Washington, D.C., you would likely find that the required R value of the assemblies will change. Um, you might even find that the glazing percentage and the orientation of the building will also change. So in terms of an optimal R value, I think one, it depends on where the building is. Um, uh, two, um, optimal will have a lot to do with the other choices that are made in the building design and planning. So the geometry, thermal bridging, the windows that are chosen and such, um, the performance of those windows, the orientation of the building will all relate to the R values that are required for wall, ceiling, slab, foundation wall, et cetera. So as I said before, it's a, it's a performance standard, not a prescriptive one. And it really requires you as the designer working within this energy balance to you know, make choices about what is optimal in terms of achieving both um, energy reduction, conservation, but also um, allowing for certain things like um, the energy gains through, through windows. So it's, there's not really a quick and easy answer about an optimal value. But I think um, you know, looking at our, our kind of cost analysis, it's clear that one can afford to pay a premium for the increased insulation and the higher performing windows and have enough savings in terms of the annual operating costs that if that, that um, you know, cost of upgrade is amortized over 30 years, um, that that will be paid for um, through the savings in, um, in operation. Thanks. How do you calculate for the global warming value for extruded polystyrene manufacturing and compare this to the energy saved by using it to isolate a foundation system? Again, I think that, you know, that is a great question. And I think, you know, if we are to do this again, um, or when we are doing it, we're looking at different materials to go under the slab. A type 9 EPS, I think, is a material with a much, much lower global warming potential that passive house designers are using throughout their buildings to sit under the foundations. So we probably would not specify 12 inches of XPS, given how it is made now in this country. Um, that could change in the future. But I think with any, any, um, any product you choose, one should be aware of um, you know, its impact beyond just the conservation. Uh, that said, 
they do make a material similar in Europe with a much lower global warming potential. So it's not that it can't be done. It's just not being done right here, right now. Um, but I think having, um, you know, one's kind of thought about uh, of these materials and the global warming potential is critical. A lot of the walls we're looking at now are double stud walls, all filled with cellulose. So we're really also trying to eliminate a lot of the foam even used on the upper parts of the walls, the polyiso, which does have a lot less, um, uh, much lower global warming potential than the XPS. But um, it still seems an all cellulose wall seems to marry a lot better with the goals of a very low energy, low impact building like a passive house. Thanks. Since the systems used on this Habitat for Humanity house are more complex and expensive, how do you get the actual cost of the house down to be affordable to the affiliate? Um, well, the, the heating system is actually less. Uh, than you know a conventional forced air system, and it also provides cooling. So if you if you think about that system alone, there's actually a reduction. The heat recovery ventilator that was used is likely a more expensive unit than what is out there and available. But um, in terms of the uh, heat recovery um, performance and the low energy that is consumed, um, given the energy savings, you know one can one can uh, you know, afford more expensive and higher performing piece of equipment like that. But I think you know, in total, we're not looking at a dramatic cost of increase in, um, in mechanical systems for this building. We're just shifting some costs um, from one system to another. And, um, and actually, the total cost of the mechanical system um, is less. And so you know, that, some of that savings has gone to pay for the increased cost for the insulation and the windows themselves. A cost analysis is always, you know, one of those things that's that's hard to think about because if you think about comfort, um, and then you compare, uh, say, a radiant floor heating system to this system, you're achieving comfort through the radiant floor system, but you're paying a premium for that delivery. Whereas we're achieving the same comfort goals with the envelope. Likewise, with any windows one might find themselves paying a lot more for um, a specific profile for the window versus the thermal performance of the window. So you really have to evaluate you know, what you're trying to compare, because I can find windows that even cost more than these windows but don't have the same performance values. So I think you know, in total, um, these systems will cost a little more, but it all depends on what you're comparing it to. I think we have time for one more question. Um, can you explain the spikes in the indoor air quality? Um, well, the indoor air quality sensor is actually in the bathroom. Um, maybe not the best place uh. to put it, but we wanted to put it near an exhaust port so it was not near a supply. And that exhaust happened to be in the bathroom. So those spikes you see are essentially when the bathroom is being used or a shower is taken. And they're temporary. And you can see immediately after um, that space is, the, the air is evacuated from that space, they go back down to normal. So it's a very sensitive piece of equipment, which is not only measuring CO2, but was, is measuring about eight volatile organic compounds and doing a CO2 equivalent. So I think um, it's the location of the sensor that's registering those, um, those temporary spikes. But on average, it's, it's well below um, the um, you know, levels of what one would consider to be very good air quality. So we are right at the time that we need to wrap up. So really, thank you so much, JB. And just Thanks. for everyone out there listening, we will send all of your great questions to JB. And if you, know, if you if he can answer via typing out the answers, we'll then post those answers on the, the Housing Knowledge Community website. So okay. This I'd is a reminder to, to. Oh, thank you. So this is also a reminder to complete the webinar survey. Uh, this continuing education report form is now available at the Zoomerang site that you should be receiving. So once again, thank you so much, JB. This is that was wonderful. Thank you, Stephen. Take care, all. Okay.
Bye.